Hello, everyone. Welcome to Quasar Alchemy Live. I'm Jay Yaller, one of the founders of Quasar Science. This week, we have Charlie Lieberman, ASC, with us to basically take a look back on his career and how he went from stills to movies and to some really well-scripted and shot series. I've had the pleasure to have gaffed many, many projects with Charlie. Charlie, you didn't start out in cinematography, but rather as a photographer in Chicago. Tell everyone about that and who you followed and shot and really what got you interested in film. Well, I was a self-taught photographer. I had been to college and decided that there was not a lot there I wanted to keep studying. So I had this dream that maybe if I could learn how to take a picture, one or two that were halfway decent, then I might have, maybe I could try that out for a while. So I did that. And after a year or so, I started walking around with a portfolio and um, started getting the odd job or selling the odd picture here and there. Uh, eventually, I found myself getting an assignment that took me to 14 third world countries uh, shooting stills for anthropology books. And that led to when I got back to the States, I think I was gone for six straight months uh, in I was in the, um, the South Seas, uh, Melanesia, Southeast Asia and Africa. Uh, those were, I was literally traveling around the world for that assignment. Uh, I then um, there was a bar in my neighborhood that would change the art out every two months. And one day I was in there having a drink and with some friends and I asked the bartender, the owner, if I could uh, put my pictures up. And he said, oh, yeah, said, yeah, we got an opening in about four months and put your pictures up. So I did. Uh, then one of the nights that they were up, a filmmaker saw them and hired me to shoot production stills on a documentary he was making. That was my introduction to cinematography. Uh, after three months after I worked with them, uh, they, uh, the director invited me into the editing room and he had cut my stills into the movie. And I was completely floored. There was a soundtrack. There, they almost felt like it was a motion motion picture the way they were cut. It was about a an Olympic boxer preparing in his training for a sparring match. And uh, I had done detail work on lacing his boots and lacing the gloves and wrapping the tape around his hands and getting getting ready for Olympic level boxing. And uh, so I started hanging around with that director. Uh, when it, he needed an occasional thing shot here and there, he'd give me a call last minute. Um, and so for the next six or seven years, I kept doing both. And I and as I did more and more cinematography, I did less and less stills. And by, I think, I guess the year was around 1978. By 1978, I was working 100% as a cinematographer. And I was doing the lowest and possible kind of cinematography. I was doing industrial film, educational film, documentary film. And by the mid eighties, I started doing some commercials. I also got to do a feature, uh, a really a no budget feature and it's time shot in 16 millimeter. And, um, and then I continued my career as a cinematographer. Uh, and eventually that was all, all that part happened when I was living in Chicago. And then I moved out to California in 1989 and pursued uh, my cinematography career out here. How hard was it for you to uh, transition in that? Uh, well, since I hadn't been to film school or even photography school, it was the whole, everything about it was different. What was fun and more interesting is there was so much more to learn to do uh in terms of i didn't i never did any lighting as a cinematographer i would just look i was a documentary so a, i mean a, as a photographer i was a documentary photographer and all i did was find the, the good light or move to a place where the light would be good on the scene i was shooting uh, and in cinematography i had to make it all up i had it absolutely invent the way it should look to have a feeling like you would find in life just moving through the world 
Um, also, I had to work in groups. Uh, to, as a still guy, I was all over everything I shot. I did by myself. In occasional assignments, there might be some uh, a producer with me or a director directing the stills with me, but pretty much was by myself on 90% of the work I was doing. So learning to work with the crew, learning to have superiors above me, directors, producers above me, that, that was the hard part. And then the other hard part was not making every frame perfect, that sometimes you have a really good frame that moves to another frame the camera pans, the camera pushes in, and I would have, I would think, oh, it has to be absolutely perfect. It has to be a perfect still every frame. And, well, it doesn't. Um, and then I eventually, once I got into documentaries, I started to help that director edit, and that's what really brought along my understanding of cinematography. Once you start to have to cut things together and realize what you need beforehand, what you have to plan for and take to the editing room, because most of the projects I had, there was no room for reshoots later. You had to you had to deliver all the picture ready to cut and every angle and every shot had to be thought thought through. None of that happened in stills. So those those are the big, the biggest differences. How many uh, how many pages? What was your page count like back then per day? Um, that's well, if you're talking about a low budget feature, we would probably do eight to 12 days, eight, eight to 12 pages a day. Yeah. 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 It was, uh, we had no money. Uh, usually, uh, the director's girlfriend was making lunch. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was, it was very much hand to mouth. Uh, I, we'll, we'll get into some of my early feature work a little, you know, a little bit, but let me just say, I, we couldn't even find crew people that would come out and help because uh, we didn't have any money for it. So I, my first feature, I loaded all of the magazines myself. It was my own camera. And so, and one reason I was able to get the jobs because I could provide a camera. Uh, and um, I think I had an AC about 25% of the time. And the rest of the time, if I had a focus pull, the AD pulled the focus. So, wow. <laughs> very, very, very minimal. Yeah. And I, of course, I never gave him anything that was very hard to pull, but um, luckily I got to block that show so I could design things I knew we could do. <laughs> the problem is if you, try to, if you try to do something that you don't have the, um, the capability for, then it looks bad. But if you design things that you're capable of achieving, then they all come off well. Sure. <laughs> was this uh, was this the movie you're talking about? Was that Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer? Yeah, that's pretty much my first feature film. Yes. Tell tell everybody about that because you did some really interesting stuff on that, and that, that movie still holds up to this day. I think a lot of it, it's got a cult following, pretty much. Yeah, um, it's still still being rented. Um, I know uh, in in teaching through the ASC. A lot of people come up to me, and uh, once they check my IMDb uh, lists, uh, credits, they, they they come up to me and start asking me questions about that and about heroes. Those seem to be the two that keep coming up. They, um, I, I was not hired originally to shoot that. They had a guy who was supposed to shoot it who was going to do it all handheld, and as kind of more of a docudrama. Um, I read the script and the script was written and in the script it talked about cut to and it didn't, didn't feel handheld to me. Uh, I also wasn't that comfortable with shooting it handheld. So I, I decided to offer up another way to shoot it and that would be to be more of the fly on the wall. That it'd be... Uh, a three wall set in front of the camera at all times and we were the audience and we were observing things that seemed incredibly real but I thought the handheld would have detract for for all the way through the film I thought would detract from that would bring attention to the camera so I tried to make the camera less visible although 
the opening scenes in the film that set the stage, the camera's pretty visible in that it gives you this duality. It sneaks up on a bunch of scenes that you hear how the people that you see at the end of the scene, you will see them when they're dead, but you won't see the action that occurred to make them die. And, and by the way, Henry is a horror film, <laughs> if you didn't know. And um, I wanted to create these very creepy shots where the camera literally creeped and you, the audience is supposed to be thinking, I really don't want to see what's around this next corner, but I can't stop watching. And so there's a series of shots that are finding the deceased. One reason we all, would also provoke that, that way of shooting it was we couldn't afford to do action blood scenes. We couldn't, we couldn't cl have changes of clothing. We couldn't have uh, blood bags. We couldn't do action. So we could make up people very realistically as dead people. And then they laid in a soundtrack where you, as you starts very quietly and in each shot, and there's, I think, six opening shots that just are the preface to the entire movie. And you go, go through each shot, discovering what we want you to eventually see as the sound of this murder scene takes place. And it was, it, I think that's what kept people in their seats through the opening and made them curious to watch the movie. Yeah, I think it uh, you know, really holds up today. I think people can get some really good ideas on how to do something like that without actually spending all the money on effects, things you know, of that nature. Because we all know that that's, that can get into a lot of money. But Henry's a, an awesome film, the way you uh, came up with all those shots. Yeah, thank you. Um, it was... It was uh, what I didn't know when I started was that I could block that movie. It was, you know, it was a mystery to me. Okay, so so each night I would prepare the next day's shoot because we had scouted, I'd seen the locations, and the only thing we had was a western dolly, a rubber tired flat western dolly to put a tripod on. So there were there, we were very limited. I had seven lighting fixtures for the whole show, and my Grips and electricians, basically I had one grip and one electricians and their normal job was putting up party tents for summertime weddings and summertime events. So it was, uh, it was a hands-on, let's, why don't we all go make a movie and save the farm kind of are, situation. Are any of those uh, people still in the film business now? Do you know? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> uh, one guy... Who, yes, one guy who was an AC for a couple of nights is still in the business and also has is also in LA now. I haven't seen him in quite some time. And he only the last night he was there, we we did we split a roll in the camera. So he bagged up these exposed, sent it to the lab, and the next night I start shooting the other half of this 400 foot roll and after about three takes of an, a very long scene with a lot of suspense building a one take scene from the back of a car driving on the freeways of chicago the camera jams and i i knew immediately why he he didn't put a take up spool on the take up side after he unloaded the mag oh, no. <laughs> And I never occurred to me anyone wouldn't do that. So the next day, I, I said, oh, I got half a load. Let's, let's roll that half, half load off. We'll get two, two or three takes, and then we'll change film. So the camera jam, <laughs> we had to start over. <laughs> now, you mentioned you only had seven lights. You said you only had seven lights on that film. Mm -hmm. What were they? What, did you, what were you using then? Okay. Okay. Um, well, pretty much in Tungsten, I had five lights, and that traveled with us. And then one night, I had two little, like, Joker light, Joker HMIs, or whatever they were in those days. But they mm -hmm. were they were small wattage HMIs. Um, the And I had, okay, what lights were they? I think I had one zip light, 2K zip, maybe one, the small zip light. 
I had one baby junior and maybe two babies. That was it. Wow. Yeah. Pretty good. Yeah, it was simple. We, it was lit quite simplistically. You know, there sure. was not a little ever lighting going and on. What year was that again when you shot Henry? Okay, it was shot in 95 or 96. 96. And it did not get released till, I'm sorry, it was shot in 86. Yeah, it, it, it didn't get released till 89. Then it, then yeah. it, and it so happened I had just moved to LA when it did get released. Which is, got, got a great review in the Rolling Stone. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it might have helped here and there. On the shortly course. after you moved to LA, you and I met. Mm-hmm. And we, uh, you did a Chanticleer project. Um, I, I think that was your first one. And then I met you on the second Chanticleer project. It was called Session Man. Yes. Um, why don't you tell, tell people about Session Man? That, that won an Oscar for the uh, director. So Yeah, but let me tell you first about Chanticleers, because people may not know what, was, what that was. Uh, Chanticleer was a contest. And anyone in the film business could submit a script. Usually they were writers because you were submitting a script to direct a 30 minute short. And they would get about 800 entries a year and they would make, I think, six each year, um, something, something like that. And it was fully backed by Kodak and Panavision, and so you had really good gear, and and the, a lab was behind it. So every it was kind of this charity thing to give mostly writers a chance to direct something. Uh, so that's that's how that was. So uh, when I was doing com- I came to LA mostly doing commercials, and after a while I realized I really wanted to do longer form shooting and tell stories. And having shot Henry was kind of one of the motivators of that. So uh, I told my agent, if anybody comes, shows up with a script and they're looking to do something for no money and I'm available, if I don't have any other work to do, I would be happy to do that. So I, I, and I ended up doing three shorts. The first one did also got nominated for an Oscar, but didn't win. And that was for Shanna Clear. And the rule was don't reuse anybody, but the producer, the Chanticleer producer of uh, Session Man really wanted me to do a second one. I don't, I don't know that anyone else got that opportunity. So, and that, that became the one we worked on. And I met you and she, you knew the producer and she put us together. She said, I was going to love you. Um, no, she was right. It worked. We did. It was, it, was a, it, was, it was a bromance, no question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, we worked. We worked together well, and we were. We both were passionately committed to the end results. We we didn't have ego at all because it was always like, well, what's the best thing to do? And whoever has that idea is gonna gonna get it done. I usually my ideas were usually more about um, the style and look, and your ideas were more about the execution. So it was a good. It was a good. Uh, a good combination. That's um, awesome. Yeah, we didn't compete over um, aesthetic at all. You, you're, you, you felt your job was to deliver the aesthetic that I was going for. And that's, that is a good, it depends, each DP does it differently. I was very strong in the desire to have the aesthetic be my contribution. So, um, it, and you always, you always did a very, very good job at doing that as well, I might add. Well, there there was one. Well, let me finish on Shannon again. Then I'll tell you one other amusing thought I had towards the end of my shooting days. But so 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 we did the second one, and it was a really tight, lovely little script about a a um, studio musician who gets a chance to possibly take over from a lead guitarist in a uh, monster rock band. And it was a it was a cute little story, and it had a nice beginning, a middle, and, a, and an end. And it was a lot of fun to shoot. Uh, I got to shoot shake BB King's hand because we were he was recording in the studio that we were using as a location. And I can't I can't remember. I think we we're in there five nights or something. 
Yeah, five nights. Yeah. Five nights. Yeah. So so we were there quite a while, and and the, when people were recording, they never looked at the clock of at least the big the big names, and uh, so it was it was a one of my great celebrity encounters in my life was to shake BB King's hand, which was the largest hand I had ever shook till to that time and since. I could not even grasp all the way. You know, it was like like. Um, it was large, <laughs> <laughs> and he was a lovely man. Uh, he was, and I was a I was a huge fan, so that's why I walked up to him. I'm pretty shy about celebrities, but I walked up and said, "I had just gotten one of his new albums, so it was a it was a really good moment." So, and then it went on to win an Oscar, so that was pretty good. Yeah, I thought we did some pretty good stuff on that for the, you know for the first time you and I meeting and working together. I, I thought it went pretty well. Yeah, well, I I called you back. <laughs> you did. <laughs> <laughs> so, must have been okay. Um, I, yeah, it, it was good. And I don't know. We worked together for on, on and off over many many years. So that's right. Tell tell people why it's important for a cinematographer and a gaffer to click or you know work together. What what are what are the things that that make that important? Oh, I think it's the most important relationship on the set, uh, especially like I wound up in TV and directors come and go. But on a set in television, the person that's there week after week, month after month, and sometimes year after year is your gaffer. And the more you work together and are comfortable with each other, the more everything turns to shorthand. And all the all of the unspoken understandings are there that aren't there when you're starting with somebody new. So it's uh, it's very important to be loyal to the crew members that are serving you, who are constantly serving you well, uh, and to, to reward them by uh, hiring them over and over and over again. So the, the only time it's ever been an issue for me is when sometimes you find some very, and this is true at any position, you find some very ambitious people who aren't capable of keeping their ambition uh, in check. So if they were hired on as a gaffer, but really want to be a DP, and somehow that leaks through, that's not a good thing. You need, you need to wear the hat of the job you've signed up for. And it's great that you have ambition. And I, I have helped a lot of people move up within a crew constantly. Um, loaders who became operators in the end, who moved up step by step. Uh, but uh, you got to wear the hat that you were hired to do, and you cannot try to undermine your cinematographer. And that holds true all the way down the line. Actually, it yeah. happens with best boys, you know, who want to bump up. It, you know, it's very uh, true. Best boy grips. It, mm -hmm. it all, you know, all the way down. Yep. And it's, it's a tough competitive business. It's you have um, hundreds and hundreds of people after your job. So you 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 want people who are going to who again, I never cared whether people were ambitious or not. I liked it, loved it when they were ambitious, but I only cared how they performed on the set. And that's what those people came back, because even if they were eventually going to move on to higher positions, they were still doing the the job I needed. And I always appreciated that. Right. You and I did a commercial together and I can't remember what that commercial was. I don't, uh, maybe it was an insurance company, but there, it involved two people standing at a water cooler mm -hmm. talking to each other. And you came up with something very interesting because we scouted the location and it was not going to work. Tell, tell people why it wasn't going to work and what you came up with. Sure. You know, I can't remember the client either, but I know we were shooting from a rooftop. Uh, like, I think we we're five stories or so, and we we're mm -hmm. shooting a high rise building across the street uh, that we were out there scouting for. And the shot is that we're going to go from one office and hear what's going on there. And we pan to another office and those people are queued and there's some action that takes place there. And I think it was a total. And then we go down a floor. And I think we were in five different offices that we 
found this arrangement in this building that we could dress these offices and um, make them look like what's what's written in the script, what they had to be, except for one office, when which we're looking at and we're talking on walkie talkies to the the other the location people across the street in the building. There's a wall between what we're seeing. We can't see the wall because it's right along one of the mullions and pillars dividing the windows. So we go, you know, oh, can you just cross over to the other side of the room? And they go, they go no, there's a wall here. <laughs> so, but when what's written is two people are at a water cooler. And uh, but we need to see this space of two small offices just be one small office. And I just had the. Uh, the, the brainstorm to cut a water cooler in half and place the whole unit half on one side, half the other. So I asked, send somebody in the other room and just talk to them. And can you hear each other through the wall to deliver the dialogue? And they did, and they could hear each other because it was just a, uh, what do you call a, a quick, I don't know what you call it, but it wasn't a concrete wall. It was just a, a drywall wall and an interior wall cheaply made and so they could hear each other so i was like great we'll put one actor on one side they just can't hand anything to each other they're just standing around the water cooler talking so we did that we lit it it was a pretty cool commercial i had forgotten about it till you brought it up so. yeah it was uh, a, it, it was pretty cool because from outside you couldn't tell that there was no wall there you know it was they were talking to each other and <laughs> exactly we got the shot. The director got the shot. We didn't have to go re-scout a whole new location. Right. Yeah. And because the other five, four rooms were perfect. You know, That's right. They, they, the, the moves the camera had to make, the way, the amount of time and distance the camera had to move before the dialogue car carried on, because there was dialogue in every room. So, and I guess they were all radio mic'd and uh, with a sound man recording on every floor. I think we, we covered three floors. Five rooms and three floors, I thought. I think it was. So yeah. it was fun. That's probably the most fun part of cinematography. Well, there's many fun parts, but one of the most fun parts is figuring out how to do something that's no one's ever going to notice. <laughs> so they just say, oh, yeah, these people are sitting, standing on each side of a water cooler talking. And, that's right. And no credit will be is given based to anyone by anyone because i bet the agency people didn't even know we did that yeah you know, i'm sure i'm yeah. sure but you know it's, it's coming up with solutions like that on on a set that that works you know and, and this is one thing that i keep trying to put across to people is you you've got to be able to think on your feet and come up with solutions or problems that happen all the time, because that's all there is. It's, there's always a solution for something. My day on a set, which after I, after maybe halfway through my career, I started to realize that I'm asked a hundred or more questions a day from all the different departments, probably 200 or 250 questions a day. And you have to manage all that. And you can't let anyone feel that they are not given their full sh full answer to their question. They're they're there because they're as they're as devoted as you are to the end, and they're not interrupting you. They're they're asking for some valuable information. You know, wardrobe. Will will this uh, pattern moiré? And uh, can we go with a sh with this something this white or whatever? You know, back in the old days, shooting white shirts was a problem. It was, couldn't the hand the camera couldn't handle the contrast the film couldn't handle the contrast range. That's right. And so, um, so then that's that's over the time I started talking about that it, that cinematography was so collaborative uh, that I that was what I had to learn because I was a, that was completely new. Within the collaboration came incredible friendship though which you don't get when you're working alone. And um, and the relationships of, and the joy of executing the, the assignment and having it work is just, just incredible. Uh, and I forget, going back a step about career, I mentioned that there was something I learned, I saw, looking back, I saw later. I 
for some reason that I can't explain, producers saw something in me that I didn't even see in myself and gave me the next more difficult job when I was not even sure I was going to be capable of it. And I, but I could see every job moved, went to the next one, which was the next bigger budget, the next more difficult thing to shoot. And somehow these producers had confidence in me to shoot something they hadn't even seen on my reel. And um, that, that's probably the point in my career I finally took a deep breath and said, okay, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna survive this. <laughs> I'm gonna be okay. Because it's a tough career. You're you're committed. You're putting yourself on the line every single day. You go to work every day in the film. In the film, even as a gaffer, as a key grip, every you know. I think the only people who sleep are the are the electricians and the, and the grips. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that night don't go home one worrying. About That's right. It. And the sound department, of course. They yeah. sleep. How do you how do you uh, decide when you should stand your ground on something? If a director comes up and and wants to do something that maybe you're not agreeing with, or maybe the lighting setup might take longer the way you want to light it. Um, how do you how do you decide that? Right. Well, over as the career as the career evolved, I start. I decide. I pretty much didn't wind up often having to defend the lighting situation because I always trimmed it to the best we could do with the time allotted. Mm -hmm. That's probably why I kept, I didn't get fired <laughs> at all because I made the days. So I didn't have, I might have to defend things in prep, but by the time we're on set, everybody should be knowing what we're doing. Uh, I think the harder part is when a director wanted to do things that I knew would take longer than we were budgeted for. And that is a different kind of standing ground. Well, I wasn't standing ground for my lighting. I was standing ground for getting the day, making the day, getting the show shot and not have, not being carry, things carried to the next day, especially if you're on your location, you're not going to have it there. And if you go over time, it's, it's very upsetting in the lower budget things so um my way of doing it was to always was to never do to always suggest i would always make suggestions and never say this is how we have to do it and i would put it in a way that i would let the director or the producer decide so if we were in a situation on the day we're, we're ready to shoot we, it's blocked and he decides he wants to do some some whip pans back and forth. I would, I would sit there and go, no, okay, I said, okay. And he would, I would always ask, can we do that? And I said, yes, we could do anything you want to do, we can do. But to do whip pans across this room instead of cuts, I have to hang 80% of my lighting. And to hang 80% of my lighting is going to cost you an hour and a half to two hours. Do you want to do that? Or do you want do you want to spend your hours, your cash in your pocket on hanging the lights, or do you want to go with a cut, and then we won't spend that much time on our morning shot, and we'll still be able to tweak and improve the late afternoon shots because we won't run out, run out of time. And if the director says, "Yeah, I want I want the whip pen," then you shoot the whip pen. But that's that's the strongest defense I ever put up, and I always put it in budgetary terms, in terms of um, what it was going to cost, in terms of the quality of the remainder of the day. All right. We, we you and I did a another movie together called South Central. I, you and I didn't talk about this earlier, but I bring this up because I realized that we did a scene in the old prison um, in Los Angeles. Yeah, uh, with a real long hallway. And I remember you and I talking about this scene where you wanted to do a real long, slow dolly tracking shot down the hallway. And it was kind of in reference to Henry Porter, a serial killer. You thought it'd be cool to go slow. And David Strong was the uh, dolly grip that mm -hmm. uh, he, he wasn't the dolly grip. He was one of my electricians, but he <laughs> jumped on dolly. I don't remember the reason. 
and was able to do this real long, slow tracking shot uh, mm -hmm. down this hallway. Um, but South Central, we did some cool stuff on South Central as well. Mm -hmm. Why don't you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, was that the hallway where all the jail cells were on the right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. I got to shoot some, in some better prisons after that one. Um, <laughs> that the, the 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 famous one where they shoot all the time is this. The, it's closed now, so it's available. It's a women's prison east of downtown LA. Uh -huh. and got to shoot there several times. Way more visual. It was, uh, had some great windows and it had. Um, break rooms you know where the, when they get out of jail when they get out of their cells so you had the cells plus other okay we were limited to that hallway and those those jails very tiny it was, it was more of a county or or city lockup so That's it, right. it wasn't set up and there was oh it was the, there was the rooftop we shot on too so yeah it was an interesting it was an interesting project um it um it was, the cast was an, an incredibly fun to be around. They uh, they were uh, had, had an amazing group of people who were devoted to the project, and that was probably the most fun about it. Uh, but we had some long hours. And yeah, we did some long hours on that. We did. did. We had our night. problems. <laughs> <laughs> we used a lot of color on that too. We did. Uh, we did, and I. I I was noticing that all the lights at night, all the cities were turning to sodium vapor. Mm -hmm. And by that time, LA was uh, all sodium vapor. Up till then, lights had always been, um, uh, I forget what, what uh, I forget what they were, but they were blue green and sodium vapor. Mer credit. Mercury vapor. Mercury vapor, yeah. yeah. And so, so the lights were turning all orange and I started using orange liners at night on the actor's uh, rim lights. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't seen it in a movie yet. And I said, oh, you know, the cities are orange now. I'm going to I'm going to show how current the look of this film is and that I'm not going to go with the blue green rim light that everyone has been using in urban settings. So I went with the sodium vapor, which actually all our characters were um, black gang, kid, gang kids in South Central LA. And I thought, and it looked great on their skin. I thought, okay, this is, a, this is a plan. And I think it was less than six months later, I started seeing other movies uh, take on that look. Other people, I'm Sure, they didn't do it because they saw my movie, but other other DPs were noticing that the urban lighting was changing. We're going through that again now, uh, in that everything is turning to LEDs in in urban lighting, and so uh, we're going into a new generation of city lighting, night city lighting, that we can control the color completely. And right now, LA is in talks with some ASC members as to what they can do to make the light the city be cinematic and to be easy to shoot in so those conversations are going on now I don't know if has Quasar been involved in any of that well we've had some some talks about it of course you know we we like to be involved in anything that's that basically you know lights LEDs uh, that can change colors or whatever that's something we've always, I think we've always talked about that, how cool it would be to have a whole city that's, you could actually go and shoot and not worry about certain spikes of green or magenta or whatever, make the color or whatever. Right. Um, yeah. So they're working on that now. Yeah. So, yeah, that's great. That's, you that's and great. I also, you and I also did one of the first high def drama series together and it was called uh, Joan of Arcadia. Yes. I'd yes. like to talk about that because being it was one of the first high def shows, there were a lot of big changes using high def with lighting and cameras and everything. Touch, touch on that. Tell people why it was so much different than film. And mm -hmm. Well, in the beginning, the first halfway decent high def cameras were pretty miserable to work with. Um, yeah. <laughs> they they had a very limited 
uh, latitude, their stop range maybe was eight, eight or nine stops. So you um, had real problems in high contrast scenes, uh, day, sunlight, daytime scenes were just very, very difficult. Uh, so it's, well, the, both the, let me start at the beginning though. It was interesting in that I couldn't get arrested to shoot a high, high def job because I hadn't shot high def. Mm -hmm. And every producer would call the agents and ask, has he shot high def yet? And my agent would call me and I'd say, nah, I've been, I've been busy working. I haven't had time. Did you, have you taken a course? No, I haven't had time for that either. So finally there was a phone call for a show. And, uh, and up to that point, what turned first in television, high def, were all the sitcoms. That's right. They, they turned on a dime. And so every single sitcom went from standard def to high def in the, in, within a year. And that went on, I think high def was in sitcoms for maybe two or three years, when then they started talking about, let's try to do a drama with it. And Joan of Arcadia might have been the first high def drama that was accepted as looking like film. Because the producer who called me, I, I, in the first phone call, I said, well, I haven't shot high def yet. And he said, well, no, but I like your lighting. So he understood what made the picture was uh, the lighting. So uh, so I we rented some, just for a day, some high def cameras. I set up all some shots. I did an interior night scene and an interior day scene on a borrowed set. And I turned the, I did it, I lit it like I would have lit it for film. And then I turned the camera on and I went, oh, okay, I get it. I could see how the high def sees differently and what I need to do differently. High def had one huge advantage. It saw really good into the shadows um, and didn't need to fill that much, but you had to watch for contrast. And then the, but the liners all hammered. You had to drop your, your rim lights down a stop or two. So those were the biggest differences. As the cameras evolved, it got better and better and better. So that, that first camera was a Sony 900. We had to stop at least twice a day to reset back focus because the, it couldn't handle the heat uh, of the, me the materials, the metals expanding and contracting, and it would go out of focus. So right in the middle of some incredibly dramatic scene, uh, we'd have to say, uh, sorry, we got to fix the camera. And the actors had to go sit down and it took 10 minutes at least to yeah. put the camera back in focus. So that was incredibly annoying. Uh, then and after I, that, what? I think we had three, didn't we have three full-time cameras that no, were two. working? Two. two. Yeah, there were two. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. three. Yeah. yeah. We might've had a third if we were doing something special, but it was pretty much two cameras. It was pretty much like what they call a one, still call a one camera show. Yeah. Uh, and they still call sitcoms three camera shows, even though they could have four or five. Right. And so the one camera shows, none of them are one camera anymore. Everybody has two. Uh, but in those days, uh, that was still before the everybody has two cameras. But we had two because we didn't have any processing. So they saved that money. We were recording on tape. It was before SSDs. So we were recording on a, a cassette about this big. And... Um, uh, and often our cameras would drift apart during the day. You know, one would be a little more magenta and the other one would be a little more green. And so there was variation. But we did have a high def calibrated monitor. And so that was uh, that was the Bible that we went by and how things looked. And if, it, if we could see it good on the monitor, then that was fine. So in a, in a way, there were the what I missed while shooting high def was I love the mystery of dailies that I'm the only one who knew for 24 hours what we shot and that mm -hmm. nobody saw anything till the next day. And then, then they get their surprises. Uh, I, and I knew what it was going to look like, but no one, no one else, no one else on set did. And I also demanded black and white monitors for the video taps in those days, because I, didn't I couldn't see the lighting in a color monitor. The the monitor the video taps were pretty terrible, but I could still mm -hmm. see the, the contrast ratios on a black and white monitor that I couldn't see at all in color. And I got a lot of complaints. I stood my ground on black and white monitors. They were cheaper, 
but uh, a lot of directors and actors, why don't we, why don't we have color monitors? This is awful. No, I'm sorry, they're my tool. <laughs> you know, the, the monitors are here for me to see, to watch the, 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 um, the action and make sure a light hasn't gone out and to make sure that the, the rim lights are just glancing off the parts of the face I want them to. So, um, uh, so each it had its each had its advantages even at the beginning with the low light, but as the cameras evolved, they got great. And I think the first the Alex the uh, Genesis was pretty good, pretty nearly there. At least it was a full frame sensor, so we had normal depth of field. But the Alexa just changed everything. Suddenly there was a camera made for cinematographers, and that that was gorgeous. And of course, all the newest ones, all with all the K's, that they're, they're pretty. They're pretty amazing. That's right. They're pretty amazing. That so, seemed to be about the time when lighting started changing yes. as well. Yes, and that was the. Uh, that's I. I think that's an even bigger change in terms of how a set operates and how the work gets done. Uh, that you can put lights. With that are battery powered in the smallest of spaces that used to have to run cable to, shooting cars at night. It's a whole incredible. It's such an easy world now, with all the different kinds of LEDs. You could put them. You know, your fixture is so much more condensed. You could have the softest fixture fixture in the smallest space, and it's still soft, um, and it's only two feet away. And it's very hard to do that in tungsten uh, and not spill light everywhere. That's right. So um, it's it was uh, the lights now, plus the color temperature shifts. You used to have to go up in gel lights. You used to have to put, you know, either gel the light or throw a, a, a cut gel and a metal ring in it. it. Things took longer. And the one thing I've noticed in judging for film fat for the ASC awards uh, and also for new members, we're finding p young cinematographers are getting better younger. In my generation, you had to be up into your forties before you had a full complete handle of what you were doing creatively. Um, it's, um, and that was partially because you didn't see it till the next day. So you would have, you would, you would shoot it, go to the lab. You wouldn't sleep all that night when you really took a risky, a risk of how you were shooting something like going very dark. And, uh, you took all those risks in increments. You would risk a little more and a little more on another time you were shooting something. So it took years to develop that pre-visualization skill that you could pretty much count on what you're going to see, what you see, you have pre-visualized as to what you'll get. When you're shooting high def, you, what you see is what you get. You, you can build your LUT in, you could have everything done, your monitor LUT set, and it's, you learn much faster because it's immediate. The, the only part of it I feared early on was that there were going to be nosy people suggesting things uh, on how to shoot stuff. And I was really lucky. Uh, if it happened, it was incredibly minimally. And um, one one producer would come in and suggest setting a light. And luckily, every time he did that, the light hadn't just turned on yet that he was suggesting. <laughs> like a separation light of a plant against a wall, just a little glow, you know, some tiny little thing. And luck, and I, I would just nod and go, yeah, okay. And then yeah. sit there for five minutes and the light would turn on. And he'd be, eventually he turned to look at me and said, okay, I get it. And he stopped even talking to me about anything about lighting after that. Just, just let me go. Sure. So I had it pretty good and that no one bothered me. And I, that was a fear that uh, too many people were going to see the results immediately. And, and the only person I had problems with was a UPM. The, the unit production manager would come down and point out 
reflections of lights in cabinet windows and I was and I was halfway through lighting so they hadn't even been dealt with yet and who knows if that light was even going to be on in the scene so and he would do that and I finally threw him off my set after about six six episodes like that I said you're distracting me you're taking me out of my what I have to do and I got to talk to you and I don't stand over your shoulder and make sure you're counting you're adding up your numbers correctly that happens a lot that happens a lot with with everybody it seems like yeah but it was the upm it wasn't even my boss yeah or the director <laughs> it was the director or the producer fine but this was the upm <laughs> anyway so but yeah I, I, I think i was less sensitive back in those days than i became later where i realized people are just trying to help and uh so instead of chase kicking them off the set i just should have said please you're you're distracting me you know i i i have my job to do you have your job to do if you take me out of my thought process i might forget something right that i don't get back to and then we're ready to roll and i have to tell the actor oh i need a minute that's the other thing you never do once the actors are called to the set and you need to call them about 10 minutes before you're ready for them and let them know so they can be touched up and get out of their trailers and all that. So you have to tell the AD 10 minutes early when you're going to be ready. And then when they step on set, you got to be ready for that. Do you, uh, do you ever appreciate those limitations? I love the limitations. Necessity is the mother of invention. No, the, 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 little celebrations that go on inside my head every day were this when every, those hundred questions got answered sure. and after like let's say of an onslaught of six people and it's and they're all trying to talk at the same time and you say okay time out and then you would either by the order in which they arrived or the importance of how quickly they needed to have an answer you would kind of guess and so and then you when they were gone and you're sitting back at the monitor waiting for all the work to happen so we could begin shooting it's like well that was fun <laughs> that, that was great that i could didn't have to ever say oh give me five minutes to think about that you know you could just get, go through those things but that took ex experience to get to that stage what, what do you think are the important uh, steps, be politics between a DP, cinematographer, and a producer? With a producer, um, you, you need to make your day. And you also need to, to realize that you're, it's not your show, it's their show. And the same with directors, especially on staff directors, who are producer directors, if they're on staff. Uh, they are the managers of the show. You, they're, you are part of their machinery and have to, have to uh, abide by their rules. I had really great producer directors that were just some of the finest people I ever worked for that thought my lighting was getting a little too edgy, and I had to. And their excuse was it just didn't feel quite as real to them. You know, and, I, and I ended up later in my career being able to go completely pulled out all the stops to edginess on Heroes. But at that point, I would have liked to have experimented a little more with some of that edginess in certain situations and was asked not to. So mm -hmm. you just say, OK, I'll save that idea up for another time because they're in charge, you know. If, if you're at home waiting for the phone to ring, you're, you're not going to be around, you know, you're not going to make enough money to be around when the good jobs come. So you have, yeah, that's true. You have, you have to behave. <laughs> now, with directors, I already told you, the, the, the important thing is to never say I have a better idea, but always make suggestions and let them choose. And no. Nine times out of 10, they'll eventually think it was their idea and not even mention in a situation where credit might be shared, not even say anything. And you got to be OK with that, too, because your job is to make the end 
the movie, the TV show, the, the, the commercial, whatever you're shooting, the second unit is to do it well. And you get take pride in that and not even expect anyone to comment. Uh, I was I was told that when I got hired on Heroes that the creator of the show did not, he was very shy, really lovely guy, but he didn't come down and talk to the crew members very, very much. So, okay, I will have to survive without comments, you know, positive reinforcement from my boss, which was fine. It turns out he did come down to the set eventually and complimented me. It was great. I think this. Uh, I think the same kind of thing happens a lot with gaffers and DPs, also. Yeah. Because uh, you know, any seasoned gaffer may think he has a better idea. I joke with another cinematographer that I work with a lot, Mark During Powell. Sometimes mm-hmm. I'll joke with him on set and and say things like, "Well, that's how you want to do it." <laughs> but in reality, he's the cinematographer, and he's the cinematographer for a reason. So I always try to give them what they, I always try to give them more than what they want. Um, as I did with you as well. Yeah. Um, now I've had gaffers who would roll their eyes, not as a joke. <laughs> well, yeah. And uh, often they were more conservative lighters than I was. They would, they thought you had to follow certain rules. And I felt, yeah, to some degree, but sometimes breaking a rule is kind of fun and could be even more interesting in certain, depending on if it fit the scene and the setting and i there's a lot of gaffers who only want a light from the upstage side so mm-hmm. like i'm lit from the down the wrong side in my own kitchen here uh, but they would only if i'm if my eye line is this way they'd want the light coming in this way and i found ways to get really interesting lighting from many different directions and not be absolutely married to one source and very often that source may not agree with the the way the room is laid out or the way you where you are in the world so sometimes you have to find ways to improve on lighting that isn't by the rules because that's the the direction that the director wants to shoot from well i'm you know i'm guilty of that myself i like to light from the look and but that stems mostly from doing TV shows where you have eight pages a day and you have to move quickly all the time. It's just, it's easier to get that light in the eyes. Yes, Um, it is. But also, um, the, um, I think I, I think that idea left my mind. (laughs) Okay, go ahead. (laughs) It'll come back. Tell, tell everyone about heroes. I mean, you, you went on to do quite a few more series, different series that were all great. But you finished your career probably on a high note. You did the biggest series that I know of that was shooting at the time, Heroes, the biggest budgeted. Yes, it was. Uh, tell people what it was like to do that, move on to that, how many days you had per script to shoot, mm-hmm. um, how many pages per day, what some of the hurdles you had to cross. Hurdles well, for- are very also. I mean, uh, yeah. Heroes. Yeah, the first hurdle was getting the job because I found out later they had looked at 70 reels. Uh, They had shot the first season already. So Mm -hmm. uh, and that was John Aronson who did a wonderful job. And then then the second season, they had experimented a little in the first season. In the second season, they decided to alternate episodes with two DPs because the schedule was so intense. So finding out later that I got the job went with 69 other people up for it, I was, I was, uh, it, it, that news scared me. <laughs> so I, well, I better be good at this. Um, then, and I, I better prove it every day that they didn't make a mistake. So that kept me on my toes. Uh, so we were averaging 12 days an episode, but we shot it in a very unusual way. Um, we like, some of the shows that do alternate DPs on episodes, each of them does it a different way. Most of those shows are still eight days per episode, which is your average for an hour of television. So we we would, but we had a lot of stunts and a, and a lot of CGI and a lot of green screen work, which is why I was surprised I got the job because I did not have a lot of that on my reel. So 
I would uh, work for eight days with the A crew. And that would be all the grips, gaffer grips, gaffer electricians, key grips and grips. And the whole crew, sound, everybody would be the A crew. Then the, after eight days with them, I would move to a B crew. And the only people that moved were the first AD, the director, and me. And we would move to a, another crew, which were part-time guys. And they worked half the number of days. And so we would usually do four more days with them. Now, the work was never delineated or lightened up for the B crew. The work was the work. We often had to use, you know, sometimes you're on location, sometimes you're on sets. Uh, but there was never, oh, this is a B kind of crew shot, set and scene, and this is an ace kind of scene. That didn't happen. So the quality of the work had to be sustained over both crews. And so that would be, and we worked five days a week, Monday through Friday. So the eight days would be shot. I'd be four days with the B crew, and then I'd be four days prepping with the incoming director. And that allowed me to go on location scouts, which I had never been on before, other than like the first episode of a season. And, and all, the, all the rest of the scouts were looking at photographs of, of the scout or Polaroids back in the old days. So uh, now, now it's all digital. So that was quite a delight because you could determine which side of a high rise building you wanted to be on. If you had to shoot all day, you could be on the north side. You could make sure uh, if you were in an alley at noon, you might want one with some tall buildings so you could have some shadow and bring in your own rims, whatever. You, you knew where to park all the, the trucks. You knew where you could set them and they would never have to be moved for the entire rest of the day. All of those things. You knew how much cable to order. Usually, the the best boys were on the lo location scouts, and they would often order too much gear because they were terrified to be caught without something. So I could limit some of those decisions because I was I didn't have to answer. I knew what I would need. They didn't. No one had to fear me. <laughs> and over order because of fear of letting me down that's no one wants to let the dp down no one so, so that was pretty cool about the alternating the it was a little scary at first because i wasn't sure my ego would handle the um the sharing because i had always been the dp of my shows uh what i ended up it was worth the trade-off because between the location scoutings and the four days of normal business hours every other week i would have four days that i could recover and put way more intensity in for when i was back shooting so and it ended up being one of my two favorite shows that i ever ever shot and my other favorite one was the first show i ever shot uh, was my so-called life and Joan of Arcadia would be if I had to pick a third that would that would be among the top three that's great was there any episodes in Heroes that really st stick in your mind where the lighting was you know really just really stuck in your head and what what yeah, was have, it you were doing it I have two that I really remember um so if, for the people who might have seen all the shows of Heroes, there's one where um, Claire, the cheerleader, is being stalked around her house uh, by the, uh, the, um, the most dangerous character in the show. And everything is, it's day outside, but there's no lights inside, and it's pretty crunched and scary and did, did a lot of little things about it where uh, the stalker's face comes up on a little dimmer when it's reflected in a in a glass cabinet window and she doesn't see it because she's facing the other direction and it was a build-up of a lot of short shots uh, a lot of takes and it moved all over the house so that was kind of that was really fun to do uh, 
what else? There were so did, many. Did you do a lot of? Uh, did you have to do a lot of green screen or blue screen? There was a lot of yes. There was a lot of green screen, blue screen. A lot of our set extensions. We were New, New York City rooftops. We were Paris rooftops. Uh, we had huge, huge rooftop sets with uh, the green screen went all the way up to the rafters on the biggest stages at um, at Sunset Gower. So that was that was were fun. It was quite quite an adventure. I learned so much more about prepping because so many elements had to be set the day before and I re learned so many better got so many better skills about keeping everyone in touch every list of things we needed for the scenes in the in the episode or put out in emails to every every producer got them every um every crew chief got them even transpo got a list of the things we needed so there were no surprises by the time we got to set and it was it was absolutely the greatest and best crews i got to work with for my whole career from the top to the bottom because everyone loved the show the actors never went back to their trailers they just hung out on set when it, mm -hmm. when when we had to turn around do a turnaround they wouldn't leave till the scene was over and they they loved the crew they everyone chatted everybody else up it was it was really great that's awesome. Yeah. How about my so-called life? What, you had a lot of fun on that series too, I would assume. I did, but I was I was terrified because it was my first TV show. I actually never, almost didn't. Well, they're both shows I didn't want at first because my so-called life I wanted to do features, and then they had made nine and shelved it. And Claire Danes was 15 years old, and they decided, oh, let's let's shoot six more, and then we'll start airing them. So they had been made. I, th I think they went into like a four month, five month hiatus, and then the DP decided not to come back. So that's how I got hired for it. And it was a, a one of the shorts I shot that the that the director producer saw, and co my agent happened to be in a coffee shop in line behind the producer director and they got to talking and he said he was looking for a dp to pick up the show and my agent recommended me <laughs> and that's that's how i got the interview so wow and I had no yeah luck luck matters luck matters when you're ready if you get lucky before you're ready to do something then you fail but i was always, i had that luck a few times so, like the director coming into the bar and seeing my pictures on the walls to hire me. I wouldn't have been a cinematographer. I'm an accident. It's completely <laughs> accidental that I became a cinematographer. If he hadn't walked into that bar and saw those pictures. Is that bar still there in Chicago? I do don't you know? know. I don't know. I haven't been back to Chicago in quite some time. I do know that the owner did pass away. Um, his ex-wife was one of my best friends. And so... Uh, I, but I don't know uh, what happened after he passed, and that's about three, four years ago. So, so how many how many episodes did you end up shooting of my so-called life? Then you said they oh up yeah we hired for six, but they added four more, so I did ten. So I I did one more than the the original guy. So and it was shot in sixteen millimeter, which I think might have been why I what helped me to get it because I was had shot tons and tons of 16 millimeter and uh it uh well the hardest part was learning how to work with the crew i had never i had just got it i got into the union and was available and on the roster for that show but i had never worked with the union crew i had operated everything i had done up till then did i, did I, I operate south central didn't i Yes, you did. Yeah. yeah, that's what I thought. So up till then, I had been my own operator. And so there were some clashes over that because I could see uh, I had an operator who thought he had to do everything on the wheels, even when a uh, fluid head would have been better. And he fought me on that. And uh, I, I didn't have I, I didn't have enough confidence in myself yet to just tell him to go shh shut up and sit down and um, right <laughs> so it was a conflict 
And also, I didn't know enough crew people to 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 staff it because I hadn't worked with union people up, mm -hmm. up then. So I had to kind of go with people that the producers knew. So once I started getting my people in and people that I that I was compatible with and could, would get along with me, uh, then it got easier and easier and easier. Okay. Well, Heroes was. 10 years ago, was it not? 10? Yeah. 10, Ram, ten yeah. Right. It ended 10 years ago. Yeah. Right. And you're, so you're retired now, pretty much. Tell, tell people what you're doing now. To a second. I got to wipe a tear away. <laughs> uh, what am I doing now? So I returned to stills. I uh, was, I knew back around 2005 or six that, we all reach certain limits in life and we can't we can't stay up that late <laughs> we can't work 15 hour days anymore and so i decided i'm going to start playing with stills and in my time off shoot a few i i had a show in utah one season i think that i can't remember what year that was but i'm going oh it's mountains i like to hike and backpack so i'm going to start shooting landscapes and stuff and just go play so i was over over the course of um until 2010 2011 i started to play in stills and then i got very serious 10 years ago and uh, started really really working on the stills and seeing watching to see if i could evolve and keep getting better at that because we're not supposed to suddenly bloom late in life we're supposed to just chill relax and and uh most most uh explosions of creativity happen with younger people so but it's been fun i've had a great time i've gone mostly back to landscape but i i did go i did well i have to this is a little longer story I, in the, when I went around the world doing anthropology books, I had adored India and had kept promising myself someday I'm going to get back to India. Finally, in November of 2018, I went back to India and shot people for the first time. I had been doing landscape for years and years and years and was suddenly immersed in urban areas of India. I was there for three weeks and had a great time and shot a lot of pictures of people but it's also a very easy place to shoot people people are inviting uh and gracious about being shot they don't they don't get angry and they don't ask for anything they don't they don't expect to be paid the only th thing i was repeatedly asked to do was to show them the picture on the back of the camera they, they would wait i'd say thank you and namaste and turn and leave and they would um Say, stop me no 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 and indicate they wanted to see the back of the camera and the picture that i took so. well one of my one of the favorite things i do each week is meet up with you and go shoot <laughs> landscapes mm -hmm. it's a, you know it's very relaxing i i enjoy it quite a bit i've learned a lot from you um you know we we meet up in malibu lake malibu creek paramount ranch early mornings um we keep talking about going to Iceland together at some point, which you've been to now, what, three or four times? Uh, four total. I was there on a documentary in the 70s, uh, but I've been there three times to do stills and three years well, in a row. <laughs> your photography is amazing. Thank you. Uh, you know, why don't you tell people where they can go and see your work because you have a website. I do. It's charlielieberman.com. Uh, I should say, and Charlie is spelled C-H-A-R-L-I-E dash Lieberman, L-I-E-B-E-R-M-A-N dot com. And or just Google Charlie Lieberman and uh, probably the first thing, the biggest hit that comes up will be my website. So, yeah. And then if you want to, you can contact me. Uh, there's a, a contact uh, that you can click on and you could fill that out. And if say you're not a robot you can uh i will receive it <laughs> when it works it's been working pretty good for a while now it works pretty well is there anything else you want to talk about today is there anything that you want to talk about no, well, 
up the, for those all those nice remarks, the check is in the mail. So, <laughs> I could use it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we all can. Oh, the only yeah, the other thing about uh, the the landscape work we've been shooting. Uh, so we've all got locked up because of coronavirus, and me particularly because of age. That I'm, I'm even if you guys, you young kids, get to go out more, I'm not supposed. To, I'm supposed to stay locked up till we have a, a vaccine, I think, and and to perhaps the rest of this year because that's we're more vulnerable. So I've I've been living in this this house, this lovely little cabin for 31 years now. And Corona has caused me to do all my photography pretty much within walking distance of my house. And so even the days you can't, you you don't come out and visit, uh, that I still, I'm pretty much still within walking distance. Uh, so I have discovered a parts of this neighborhood and parts of the way this neighborhood look. I'm, it's, I'm very lucky that I have wilderness areas uh, on three sides and I'm nearly surrounded by wilderness areas. So it's been incredibly gratifying to go out and I'm amazed at the range of differences, the, the, the different kinds of looks I've been getting in, in this one small area just by getting out on foot. So it has been very, very rewarding. Um, there is an article that just went up online at the um, foot, foot, photographer site. If you can figure out how that's spelled. Lobographer. <laughs> yeah, photographer. Oh, photographer. <laughs> okay. Yeah. P H O B L O G refer. I think that's it. If you look for it and can't find it, go to my website, send me a note and contact, and I'll send you a link to it. And they they wrote, they did me they did a nice Q and A with me about uh, I haven't read it all back yet, but it seemed they put a, quite a few pictures up, and uh, that's that's very gratifying now to be presented as a still guy. It's it's very interesting <laughs> to to be starting over again. That's great. Well, you know, you, you've got it, you know. Is there anything you want to say to any up, up and coming DPs that are out there? Some young guys? That... Yes. Don't be afraid of the dark, which you don't have to be anymore, as mad as we used to on film. Um, oh, that's the other thing about Heroes. That was on film. So after going, being on high mm. def for several seasons, and I think I did two or three, four shows between Joan of Arcadia and Heroes. And then was I was the go-to guy for high def, um, go back to Heroes and it's still on film. And I it, I just loved it. It's magic when you no one else knows what's happening. And uh, suddenly the next day, I'm sitting at the monitor looking at my dailies and it's going, ah, yeah, yeah, that worked. That, that's good. I, I haven't lost it. It was really, really fun. So I did like closing out on film. I like the way the set worked on Fillmore. You didn't have any directors saying, yelling, don't cut, don't cut, go everybody back to one, everybody back to one, keep rolling, keep rolling. And that happens all the time in IDEF. That's right. There's no cost to it. And something about that exhausts people. And I don't know how actors can stand it because I would think they'd want to take a breath and then go start over. So, but that happens all the time. In digital and it's one of the things I didn't like I also early age of digital you, you need a 20 second pre-roll or something or sometimes it felt like forever uh, get then they started to figure out to roll sound early and roll cameras early and then now I guess you could just click and click and go but yeah. for a while there that dead time before you know when after a hundred years of well not a hundred years of sound but a hundred years of cinematography uh, there was a, a pattern in how you made a shot. And the sound shot, shot, sound came in in 1927, so from close to 100 years now, what a take was, was a ritual. And it happened almost instantly, and then you rolled, and then you stopped at the end because film was expensive and processing was expensive. And so, and a waste. Uh, that's not a waste anymore. It's just SSDs that you re-record over and over. So... <laughs> 
So I thought film was a lot of fun. It's coming back. Uh, we had a, at the SC, we had a film master class. We do we we hope to be back at it, but we were doing five or six master classes a year, and one of them was a film class, and it was sold out. We were turning people away. We usually have about 30 students per master class. And uh, so, and I know the film schools and the still photography schools are all teaching working with film again. So that, that's pretty cool. There's a place that's to very, Yeah. Well, it's now, the, it'll, it'll be the new in. I mean, some of these people in the business now have only known digital. Yes, yes. which is why they're getting better faster. I mean, I'm telling you, they're amazing 30 year old cinematographers. I'm, I'm totally uh, amazed at how quickly you can evolve. Plus, there's a lot more things to go to school on. You, there's so it's all accessible now with streaming. Uh, I used to have to get in the car on a winter night and go to a movie house to see to see something, and or even to see old movies. There were two or three um, movie houses in Chicago that all showed you know, Kurosawa and Bergman and all the, all the old art films and French New Wave. So now you, everything, you, there's a Criterion channel, you can find anything you want, you could be your own film student now. And that wasn't so easy to do, to do back then. So. There's a really, really good movie that's kind of broken up into segments. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's called Hurricane at Midnight. Have you ever seen it? No, wait, why do I, I know the title. Tell me more. <laughs> well, that's the Quasar uh, Muppet. Uh... Oh, that. Yes, <laughs> I've seen it. That's why. I, it's hilarious. <laughs> Plus, it is also incredible drama and the, the actors are brilliant. You're right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, is your well, check have... in the mail? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have anything else to ask you. Um, I if... don't think I have anything else to say. <laughs> there, does anyone have any questions from our audience? I don't know if they do or not. If we, if there are, they'll pop up here in a second. Otherwise, I'm not seeing anything pop up. So I want to thank you, Charlie, for spending this hour and a half um, with us on Quasar Alchemy Live. And uh, I look forward to meeting up with you in a few days to shoot some landscapes. Uh, thanks for having me. Pray for fog. That's when the, that's when everything's the prettiest. So hopefully, get, I think we're looking at Monday morning. Hopefully that'll work out. Great. And it's been fun. Really enjoyed thank, it. Thank you very much. Thank you.